Welcome, everyone. We are here with our friend and um, co-crusader for <laughs> I mental like that. health and brain health, mm -hmm. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, who's a communication pathologist, a cognitive neuroscientist with a master's and PhD in communication pathology. Um, she's from South Africa. She's a best-selling author. Um, she is um, like me and a huge believer in neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. And she has a brand new book called Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. Great book. Uh, five simple scientifically proven steps to reduce anxiety, stress, and toxic thinking. So my goodness, we are living in a society of toxic thinking. Boy, are we ever. <sighs> Emotional. Well, welcome, my friend. Yeah, um, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. So lovely seeing you both again. Absolutely. So why this book at this point in time? Um, it seems like it's coming out at a perfect time. Right when the incidence of mental health problems is skyrocketing. And I asked her this because I know how long it takes to write a book. I asked her this on, on my um, Instagram interview. She did not plan this during, <laughs> she did not know, just like we didn't know that there was yeah. going to be a quarantine. So if you believe in coincidence, but I would love to hear why you chose to write it when you did. Well, it was a long time coming, but as you say, I didn't know about the pandemic and that was when I had actually allocated a batch of time just before the pandemic started was when I was going to finish writing this because I just finished the clinical trials and I just finished sort of doing the analysis and thought, well, now I'll sit down to write the book and thinking, how am I going to do this? Because I travel 70% of the month and then the pandemic hit. So the, I actually had time to sit and write the book and it was just incredible because I really had the results and that kind of thing from the trials and I've been doing this for so long and I wanted to bring in this whole as we say our, the narrative that we both that all three of us share against what the current is happening in mental health and it's made it such a negative thing and it's made it so <laughs> out of people's like it, people are so frightened of of their minds and not understanding it and I, and I really wanted to bring to the to everyone into their hands what it means to have a mind and what it means to be human again and as a human we in life experimenting and we don't always make the right make, make the right decisions and we make a mess and that's okay and if you feel depression and anxiety it's part of being human and so I wanted to get away from the narrative of constantly the scary brain disease story and that you don't have control back to hey listen we are humans we can train our mind our mind is this trainable trainable thing and it's not your brain and it can work through the brain and the brain responds <coughs> and and it was just so appropriate that you know it came out at this time but i think it's 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 it, as both of all of in fact all of our work is it's always timely because mental health has always been an issue and that's something i've been saying in all my interviews is that from the beginning of time Till now, there's no, we've all been battling with our mind. Just each generation, there's just something else that we're dealing with. And we happen to be dealing with technology and pandemic and that kind of thing. But, but so mental health is not something new. And, and I just wanted to make people feel less frightened and have more accessible understanding of mind and brain and their autonomy. And, and that's why I put the clinical trials in and did it the way that I, that I wrote the book. And you talk about five steps. So let's talk about step number one in this podcast. What is the first step to reducing anxiety, stress, and toxic thinking. So the first step, well, if I can just quickly backtrack a few seconds, the five-step system is what I developed over 38 years ago, initially in a very therapeutic sense for people with traumatic brain injuries and severe trauma, war trauma, uh, Alzheimer's, autism, that kind of learning disabilities. Then I adapted it, in, adapted it into the education system and corporate and government. And then eventually I started saying to myself, but this is something all of us need to understand and know how to do. And what is that? It's our mind. We need to understand mind. And there just was not enough research around mind. And there wasn't, there was so much research, as we know, the neuroscientific explosion has been amazing, but it's been made us very focused on the biological that we've forgotten about the interaction with mind. So I really wanted to hone in on mind and understand mind, what it is, what are thoughts, what are emotions, what is mind, what is the brain, and how can we take, um, how can we use our mind to change our mind, mm -hmm. to clean up the mental mess, to, to direct the neuroplasticity in our brain. And I started that back in the 80s when they still told us, remember, Daniel, they were telling us the brain couldn't change 
in the 80s. And I remember my one, <laughs> one of my professors saying to me, saying this to me, my neuroscience professors, and I said, I just, I don't see this because we're always changing as humans. We're always experiencing different things. So they said, well, that's a ridiculous question if you think the mind can change the brain. I said, okay, well, give me the worst population and I'll do research. And they said, okay, work with traumatic brain injury. And I started and I did some of the first work in my field showing that if you deliberately and intentionally manage your mind, you can change your brain. And out of that was birthed the five steps because I was working, <coughs> I was trying to take complex complex neuroscientific principles and therapeutic principles and all this stuff and trying to make it into an accessible way of how can I help someone deliberately and intentionally change their mind. So the very first drop, the very first um, phase of it was working with people with learning disabilities, traumatic brain injuries and so on. And it was very much helping them to restore function and to go back to like if they were at school and they'd lost that ability to get back to school, get back to work. And the, the five steps then just grew. And it was it's a systematic way of deliberately and intentionally driving your mind to be able to then improve how you're functioning in your mind, which then obviously then changes brain and body. So in this particular, over the ensuing years, I developed a small, developed a theory, did clinical trials, and I still do research. And then I, as you saw in the book, I put a summary of the recent research showing the importance of the mind-brain interaction, even down to the level of telomeres. So that's kind of the background. So the five steps has got a nice long history and it's been simplified and over the years and it's it's basically our mind has got two phase zones for want of a better word and i always explain it in a very simple and a, a, a very simple analogy would be if you imagine yourself in a helicopter but it's a time machine and you are the pilot and you're the co-pilot and the pilot's the messy one like all over experimenting dry, flying learning to fly kind of thing and the co-pilot's the wise mind and we see neurobiologically that we are wired for love and we know that there's an optimism bias in in it so our whole being is Driven, drawn towards a, a balancing imbalance. That's why we have the immune system. It's getting rid of the virus. Same thing with toxic thoughts. It creates an imbalance. So our wise minds, this deep inner wisdom that we have, and that's the co-pilot. And what we don't listen to in our busy world is we don't really listen to our co-pilot. We don't tune in sufficiently to that. So the first step, the gather awareness, is for us to train our messy mind, which is actually not a bad thing. Our messy mind, the pilot, is what's act very active when we're conscious, when we're awake. And it's, we don't know what's coming up. You know, life happens and we're responding from the time we wake up till the time we go to bed. This happens, the emails happen, the conversations, the work, and we're constantly responding. And, it's, and if we don't self-regulate that and manage that, the mind's working anyway. The mind never stops. And it's the mind that's processing that into the brain. And the mind is how we think, feel, and choose. And if we don't manage that, it's very messy. And that's okay to be messy, but we're supposed to manage messy. So we do experiment. It's very, I always say that our conscious mind, the, the pilot in the, hel in the helicopter is a very messy kind of experiment of, okay, I got irritated there and now I'm fine here. And this, it's, it's regulating yourself. It's experimenting. But we've got to train ourselves to listen more to the co-pilot. So gather awareness is the whole five-step process of the neurocycle is all about self-regulation. It's all about mind management, managing our mind, which is 99% of who we are. And it's always working regardless of you wake up with your mind, you eat with your mind, you drink with your mind, you talk with your mind, you go to sleep with your mind. It never stops for three seconds. So therefore, we need to manage it. And the five steps is how we manage our mind for the big stuff, like the traumas, like you talk about in your book. And then for the day-to-day -day stuff that, that um, you're dealing with in terms of the just basic dealing with imposter syndrome if you're looking at something uh, what I did, watching social media which is such a huge thing with imposter syndrome especially with our Gen Z and you know, just worry, the little things that can happen on a day-to-day -day basis so what I bring to the table with the five steps is how can I actually be consciously deliberately self-regulating my mind all the time and that begs the question of how, how, how often can you do it? So neuroscience shows us we can do this every 10 seconds. Doesn't mean we watch our clock every 10 seconds. It means that we can be very deliberate and conscious of how am I thinking? How am I feeling? How am I choosing? How am I expressing myself? What's my body language? What is, what was my reaction? What was the impact of my reaction? We can do that in the moment. And in doing that, we can also see our patterns. What are the patterns in our life? What are the addictions? What are the cycles? What are the things that are holding me back? And that's, so then that you then would take the neurocycle into 
a deeper level where you would do it daily for 15 to 45 minutes over the 63 day cycle. So that's kind of the two applications, the moment by moment, and then the big stuff, the traumas and so on, and the toxic habits, the established stuff that you would do in cycles of 63 days, which is also part of the research that I just recently did, because you all think that it takes 21 days to build a habit, it doesn't. It takes 21 days for reconceptualization to happen, which means you can convert a toxic thought to a healthy thought, but it takes another 42 days to stabilize that. So behavior change won't happen unless you work in these cycles. So the five steps is basically used on those two different levels. So the first step very quickly, because I know that you that we, we're running out of time with the first segment, is to gather awareness. So it's to start the process of getting very self-regulated. So, and I, I chose the word specifically gather, because gather implies you have agency and control. So if you think of a huge big apple tree that's full of poison apples, and it's this big ugly apple tree, and here you are the pilot and the co-pilot, and you're flying over this massive forest, which are all your thoughts, because thoughts look like trees. So that's the scenario, this huge big forest, and you're flying over it, most of it's green, through the middle there's this dark strip of dark green trees that are perfect, and that's your wisdom mind, which is really what the co-pilot has access to, and then you the messy mind, and you're flying over this forest, and you've got this tree, the smoke signal from this big lot of dark trees, and those trees look like, uh, thoughts look like trees. That's why I use that analogy. And you make the decision to gather awareness of that signal. What is that signal? The depression, the anxiety, those addiction patterns, whatever it is, those maybe just getting upset all the time or getting irritated, whatever it is, that's the most dominant thing blocking you at that moment. Your mind, we, we have to go off to the next segment. But um, if I understand right, it's actually getting a bit of psychological distance from the noise that yes. chatter in your head and just become aware and separate yourself from it. Absolutely. It's, and it's gathering in the, exactly that, but it's gathering this, the, that's kind of the preparation phase for the whole five step process where you create that distance. And there's different techniques that talk about doing that. But then you, the gather awareness is where you actually land the plane. You pay attention to the signal, the depression, anxiety. You land your little helicopter and you get out and you stand back. And that's, you don't stand under the apple tree so that we often get into life and we just get overwhelmed. We just, throw ourselves in and we just get overwhelmed and don't know what to do. So the first step is stand back, create the distance, create the space. It's called the multiple perspective advantage. And you pick, like you pick apples off a tree, you control it, you have agency. You can reach out and pick the apples off the tree. So these, the, and these different, you would look at different signals. So you'd look at your emotional signals, like depression, anxiety, frustration. You'd look at your physical signals, like your body, what's your body doing, GI symptoms or whatever they may be, your behaviors. What are you doing? How are you showing up in the world? And then your perspective. So you gather those but you have you have agency you've taken control and that's very important with the gather awareness portion of the first step which right. is a very so quick overview we come back we'll summarize that a little yeah. bit and we'll talk about step two so helpful. perfect the, the issue of psychological distancing yeah. is critical yeah so you don't believe every stupid thing you think exactly stay with as you say the dragons <laughs> <laughs> stay with us Welcome back. We are still here with our friend, Dr. Carolyn Leaf. She's written an amazing book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. It's five simple, scientifically proven steps to reduce anxiety, stress, and toxic thinking. And in the last segment, we talked about gaining distance um, and also um, being able to sort of step back and look at the problem and, and having agency, being able to choose, correct? So we want to jump into step two. Um, what is step two of cleaning up your mental mess? So once you've gathered awareness, as we mentioned, you've gathered them, you've taken control. So that's why it's gathered, not just let it fall on your head. And you're very specific, like let's say it's day one, and you are in, in because you always work in cycles of 63 days, you may only have the um, energy or the mental 
space to take to just to focus on one or two of the signals. So you don't have to rush the process. And that's really important with gathering. You keep control all the time. And we see from neuroscience that the minute that you're aware, which is why this gather awareness is so important as we move into step two, is that when you're aware of something, the toxic thought literally, and I always use these little trees, the toxic thought literally moves into the conscious mind and it becomes more malleable. And that means it's more changeable. So if so by gathering awareness, we now are swapping from being controlled where it's in it's suppressed to controlling. And that in itself is quite, is quite painful. And that's why I always say with these five steps, when you're working with them in the with the big stuff, the toxic thoughts and the traumas and those kind of things, you're not going to do it for long. You just do 15 to 45 minutes a day. So you gather awareness if you're doing 15 minutes, you'd spend just three or four minutes on that. And then you would go to your reflect. So step two is the reflect. And reflect, and by the way, this is, I always use the trees as, as thoughts because the thoughts look like trees in the brain and like trees have got branches and roots. And so do, so do thoughts. So the thought, the branches, the roots would be the source. So the origin, that would be the trauma experience, all the roots of it. And then that would manifest in your interpretation of the trauma. So this is how you think and feel about yourself. So maybe sexual trauma, like in your case, and maybe there's the whole perspective of I'm not good enough and shame and all that kind of thing. And that's how you show up in the world in terms of behavior. So when we do the five steps of being a thought detective, you literally are looking at the signals in the plane, landing the plane and gathering awareness and tracking back to find out why why am I doing it? Because the overarching thing is we don't just show up for no reason. However we show up has a reason. And those reasons are what we need to un underscore, um, find out and embrace process and reconceptualize. So we're not just going to chop the head off the, the weed in the garden because it'll just grow back. We have to do the work. And that's hard. And we all talk about that. The three of us talk about that all the time. There is no quick fix. We live in a world that wants to give us quick fixes. So we've been kind of trained in the last 40 years for quick fixes, but, but it's not. But I like that. I want to make sure we say that again, because it sounds simple, but it's really important. However you show up, has a reason. We've got to get to that root cause. Yes. Yes. So it's really important to look at the root cause. And sometimes people really avoid that's the thing we, we try to avoid the most is what is that root cause? Cause it's painful, but however yeah. you show up has a reason. And that's important. I just wanted to sort of like, highlight no, I talk to my patients a lot about going into the pain. Yes. Rather me too. Yes. Away right. From the pain. So, no, that's so good. Awareness. Gather awareness. Two, yeah. Gather it's reflect. Awareness. To, um, is reflect. Reflect. Reflect on it. So, and how, there, how do people do that practically? So, on a reflect, basically, that's where you ask, answer, and discuss. So, if you think of a light shining through a prism, it goes in one color, it comes out the colors of the rainbow. So, there's a depth to reflection. That's why I chose the word reflect. It's got an enormous um, depth to it. So, where you ask, answer, discuss, and you're exploring, and you really are finding out why do I have that those feelings, those warning signals of depression. And I say specifically, you've, you're reflecting on what you've gathered, what's in your basket. You, you're reflecting on the emotional warning signals, the physical warning signals, the behavioral warning signals, the perspective warning signals, because all of those are telling you, they're warning signals, they're messengers, they're telling you something to, to go to your point that you made a moment ago. They're telling you something about this. And your whole objective in terms of the analogy with the five steps is to actually get to the point where you actually dig up the sand around the roots, uproot this tree and and reconceptualize it into a new healthy thought. And that new healthy thought, as you're going through the gather, reflect in the five steps, is if you look deeply inside the tree, you'll see there's dark leaves and there's light leaves. And I did this on purpose because reconceptualization doesn't mean that once you find the root cause that you eliminate your, you know, your story goes that you, it's, it's there. Like you tell your story in your book and, and we all have our stories. Um, basically your story is just reconceptualized. So now the green part is how you've chosen to live your future, not chained to the past and that the light leaves are the story, but it's changed. And that's what you're getting to. That's where healing will come. Healing will never come if you just chop the head off and it'll grow back like the roots there in the garden. So reflect is then the process of why am I feeling that emotional warning signal of anxiety and depression and then you answer yourself and I'm feeling it I think because of and then you have whatever your answer why and then answer again so you're going through this process of very deliberate and intentionally digging deeper with each of these stages what I showed with my research is that you're creating more coherence in the brain I mean I'm speaking to the brain the brain the brain doctor so you you know exactly what that means but the the, the vital importance of I look at more at the, at the alpha beta delta gamma theta those waves and what we saw was that as people start 
going deeper with the reflect where you start asking, answering and discussing. We created a beautiful, starting to create a beautiful flow between the two sides of the brain because, and you're starting to create introspection. So alpha will increase across the front part of the brain, which helps you to dig deeper. And then as, so as you're reflecting, that information that you're gathering, it's its very systematic. This process is very systematic. You don't blend it all together. You don't grab one signal and, and then unpack it. You grab the signal and then you step to the next step very systematically. So reflect is very much ask, answer, discuss. Ask, answer, discuss. That discuss portion is extremely important because you want to start taking yourself and introspecting and going as deep as you can to find out why. Now, this is really hard work. And what I showed in my in my research is the treatment effect that, um, that when things will get worse, before they get better, which is what we said. And what was interesting is that I did I put two case studies in the book with the, the little brain images and things with the uh, the, the in, in color. I don't know if you guys have got the hard copy, but we put the QEG in color. But this particular subject was interesting because this subject was like offline depression. Basically, the subject said, I am depression. They tried everything clinical. They had the label. They had done the medication, the treatments, but and they were about to give up on life. They had this work, family, sleep, everything was just gone. And by the time they reached 21 days of doing this, these five steps, they had their brain had gone to a gray level, which is what you want. Obviously, gray is different for everyone, but it's basically showing that there's a balance in the brain. But what that said in terms of the narrative is they'd gone from being I am depression, I am hopeless, to I now know why I have depression. And that's the point I want to make. So by day 21, they were seeing part of the roots. Their comment was, I've seen part, but I know there's more work to do. But by day 63 of continuing the five steps daily, which included the gather and the reflecting, we're going to do the other the other steps as well, is that they were saying, okay, I now it's now showing up in my behavior. So not only do I'm not scared of depression, I know what depression, it's telling me something, it's a helpful messenger, and I now know how to manage it. So, and I also just want to say up front, this is not replacing therapy. I'm totally for people going for therapy. Therapy is vital. Coaching, therapy, counseling. But no no one can fix you and you can't, no therapist can fix a person. We can only facilitate the process. I know that having practiced for so long and you know that yourself, Daniel. So this doesn't replace. All I'm doing, you can do any technique, any therapy, I mean, EMDR, anything. It's simply how do you live with yourself between therapy? If you use therapy two days a week or whatever, you've got to live with yourself 24-7. Well, like what you do you do with your tools, mind? It works. Yeah. yeah, you need tools and, in your tool chest. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, preview for us, and then we have to go up to the next one. Steps three, four, and five. So then, once you've get you've reflected and gathered, you've done a lot of thought work. Now you need to capture that and write that down. And you only write at this point because you don't want to because you want the systematic process of the brain going deeper and deeper, and you going deeper and deeper. So you would that's the, the writing at this point is a very um, brain on paper messy process. So we'll talk about that more in the next. Oh, okay. And okay. Four and five is. So four and five are right steps. So the the, med the th third step is to write, but you write in the form of a metacog. And then the fourth step is recheck, which is also writing. And then the fifth step is an action step. It's called an act of reach. Um, so that just kind of seals like a full stop at the end of the end of the sentence. So those are basically the three steps that you use systematically in a time frame. And you can use them in five seconds to catch yourself in the moment. You can use, but when you're doing the hard work of detoxing established traumas that you do daily, 15 to 45 minutes over right. the 63 days. So when days. we come back, we're going to talk about writing and rechecking um, and active reach. Mm. Stay with us. here with our friend Karen Leaf, the author of Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess by 
simple scientifically proven steps to reduce anxiety, stress, and toxic thinking. And I assume you can buy this anywhere great books are sold? Yes, anywhere great books are sold. Amazon sold out three times, but they've restocked. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, that's another story. <laughs> on the success yeah. of the book. Thank you. It is just needed now more than, more than ever before. And the, the whole idea I just love is that you can change your brain mm -hmm. now yeah been sort of a theme of my life exactly um, <laughs> now you can do it with your diet no question you can do it with absolutely guys um but allowing an undisciplined mind makes your brain worse mm -hmm. the it makes it amazing mm -hmm. stress um damages your brain you know i was just thinking about a study they did at ucla on people who had OCD. And OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, has its own signature in yeah. the brain where the basal ganglia are really active and the anterior cingulate is really active. And one group they gave Prozac to and it calmed things down. The other group, they just taught them how to control their thoughts. And it also calmed the brain down. So doing the mental work to clean up your mental mess can help to optimize as you show in the book the physical functioning mm -hmm. of your brain so yeah, we've absolutely. talked about gathering awareness you are not your mind getting some psychological distance um i have a fun technique we actually learned it from our friend stephen hayes um on one of these podcasts yeah. give your mind a name yeah uh which yes. is the same it's just it's that psychological yeah distancing yeah um reflect so think about it that's what separates you from all the animals uh yeah. ask answer and discuss um and then in this podcast i want to talk about the next three steps so we have to be fairly brief we want people to get the book, get the book. It will help you. Doesn't mean you don't need therapy, but it'll make therapy go so much faster. Yeah. I did two years of therapy, intensive therapy, several times a week. And it's still having those tools in between that that just help you really dig deep. You've got to be able, I mean, I think I think one of the benefits of really um successful therapy and successful therapists is, is, is when they give you the tools to do it yourself in between, like you said, oh, absolutely. You and they supporting how to you be introspective. Otherwise absolutely. you need therapy for the rest of your life. Well, that's so, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. I agree with you. And what I showed and to, to totally what you said, they what, what I showed with the like, most recent trials is that we had a control and experimental group and the control group did not get the treatment. They did not get the five steps, the neurocycle and the, and the experimental group did get the five steps and they were doing it daily via an app because we have an app as well. And the difference was unbelievable. Both got very, both became very aware of the issues because we did all the blood, doing you know, the by blood biomarkers and the psychological testing and the narrative, which was the most important and the DNA testing in the brain, the, neuro, the QEG, but the treatment group got the, they got the five steps versus the others. And so the control group, what we saw is they got worse. And, and what was I mean, one of the strongest indicators of how they got worse was looking at their telomeres. So all of them at the beginning of the, of the trial, they all came in like really in a bad place. And we looked at their telomeres and they were, and telomeres are, as you, you guys know, but for the audience that don't, it's the chromosomes that look like X's and it's all fingernails. It's the, yeah. if the end of the, at the end of the chromosomes. And just very, very briefly, just to show you how powerful managing your mind is through the, through a system like the five step, the neuro cycle is that a lot of our subjects, the telomeres were so weakened and so short. Now that's not really good because you make a million cells plus every second and your telomeres are involved in that process. And telomeres, the, re the recent research shows that they're a proxy for mind management. So the more your mind is a mess, the shorter the telomeres, the, uh, the more your cells are affected and the more your body becomes vulnerable and biologically not in the best place. You increase your vulnerability to disease by 35 to up to 35 to 90. So we found some of our subjects in the trial, and I put a case study in, who was their biological age was almost 30 years older than their chronological age and in a sickly body. So here they're in their 30s and they had a, a body of a sickly 65 year old. 
within nine weeks that had reversed and they their chronological and biological age matched, their telomeres significantly lengthened. There was no drugs involved, no diet involved. It was pure mind management because your mind's driving. I mean, that you speak about also you know, diet, exercise, we have to deal with all of those. But essentially what we saw was that those subjects that managed their mind, they, their biological and chronological age matched up and then also all the immune the biomarkers the immune system the other uh, inflammation the brain markers everything changed dramatically but the ones that didn't they got worse it was so bad that they they had so much high anxiety by the end of the study obviously we gave them the mind management and it, ch it changed things immediately but the key thing here is that we our minds working anyway you can go three weeks without food three days without water three minutes without oxygen but you don't even go three seconds without using your mind so we've got to get the help of therapy and, and all the professionals professionals like like yourselves and you know get with that the help that you offer I mean clinic and that and and therapy but we have to also live with ourselves between those sessions and that's really what the five steps do so the third step is then as I mentioned is the right the third and fourth step are both right steps and the the first right step is a get your mind and brain on paper don't worry about like a literary piece just pour it out. The biggest thing is to drag as much out as you can. So I developed a system called the Metacog, which is 38 years in, in research. And it really is a very strong way of writing. It's pattern writing that basically matches what these trees look like. So like a tree has a has a trunk and branches grow and all branches grow out of the previous branches. You basically create these patterns on the page and you just put down your thoughts. Um, and you just put down these words and whatever comes up, whatever, what, it's basically your memories in your thoughts. And there, it's a total mess but it's almost like you're vomiting it on paper. But that really pulls the two sides of the brain together and really activates the hippocampus and all the different prefrontal cortex. It, it creates such a, a, a dynamic a flow in the brain because the mind is driving the brain. And the mind, as you bring this order in the mind, you're bringing this order in the brain. And then the fourth step is the recheck where you can now go back and see, wow, what did I just write? This is unbelievable. I experienced this and this and this, and I didn't even know I knew that. It's a very revealing process. Very, I use it all the time in therapy with my patients. So I've made a simple version in the book. And then the fifth step is, sorry, so the fourth step, just to finish that step, you're going back into the messy, messy metacog, pouring your brain on paper, um, the mess on the page, literally, and you start finding your patterns, your activators, your the cycles that are happening, and you start creating, looking for the antidotes, the the reconceptualization, the other perspective. How can I see this differently? Um, what does this mean? And and so it, and it's, honestly, this doesn't happen in one sitting. I have to stress this the, to find to sort out as we all know, like toxic exercise. thinking. You have to do it regularly for it exactly. Exactly. I mean, on day one, you may just identify that you're depressed and that, okay, depression and, my, and I'm withdrawing and, or, um, and, um, there's something going on, something in the past and my, my recheck is just, I, I'm going to have to do some more work. I mean, it's, it may be, it's, it's tiny little bits every day. And that's, and there's certain key days where we saw major neuroplastic changes, like a day seven, day 14, day 21 was extremely interesting because that's where we saw gamma peaks where people actually had, were starting to say, instead of, I am depression, I know why I'm depressed. And they were starting to say, I know what to do. And then, as I said, the changes happen um, over time to 63 days where the behaviors start changing. So the fifth step then is to kind of round off the day's work. And that is, okay, so I've, uh, this is what I've learned. I've learned that I'm feeling depressed. I'm, fe uh, my I'm withdrawing my behaviors. I am, my perspective is life sucks. And I'm, my body has got tremendous heart palpitations and there's just a lot of physical stuff going on. I'm not sure why, um, but I can start seeing that there's a reason behind this and there's definitely something from my past because this is a pattern. It's happening definitely in these certain situations. So therefore my active reach could be something like, it's okay to feel depressed. There's a message in the depression. And you literally write that statement down or you, and you put it somewhere or put it in your phone or I have an app called the NeuroCycle app and it's got a little section, Active Reach Reminders, where you can type it in. And then that pops up during the day. And during the day, you, you know how we have the tendency to ruminate, especially when we've activated something from the past and you've got this, this scary thing that's these flashbacks that are frightening and overwhelming. We have to limit the time we focus on those. So the Active Reach keeps you in a safe space so that you 
can go about your day. And every time you're tempted to fall back and go and rethink through, you say, no, I'll do that tomorrow. I'm just going to focus on my active reach. And so, I mean, that's just a very simple summary. There's a lot more detail in the book and there's many ways you can do each of, there's lots of detail with each of the steps, but that's the basic overarching principle. And then you'd repeat it the next day and you'd repeat it the next day and so on until you get to day 21. From day 22 to 63, you do just step number five because by day, it takes more or less 21 days to, to be, as a thought detective, to embrace process and reconceptualize this into this of using the five steps daily. And then this is now the new pattern we want to grow. But like any new little plant that you've grown, it's just a new little thought. It doesn't have enough sufficient, enough energy to impact your consciousness. So you're not going to have a behavior change yet. But you, so you've got to deliberately practice this new way of thinking at okay. least for a minute to two minutes every day for 42 days. I love days. that you did well, not make time. this, uh, you know, three minutes to, to you know, <laughs> everlasting change. Oh, gosh, no. People no, it's a lifestyle. If you, want to, if you want to manage, if you want control of your life, if you want to manage it, this is, you have to change your habits and it's a daily practice. Absolutely. So like eating right, eating just right, like exercise, whatever out. it is. Oh, all of it. Yeah. And that's what all mind driven. Than learning to manage your mind and you have to do it every day. It's got to become more new. Well, your mind, yeah. Your mind's always with you. So if you don't manage it, then it's a mess. And so we all are messing. When we mean, come back, we're going to talk about some stories uh, from Carolyn's book and how you can go further um to clean up your mental mess stay with us your brain is always listening i am thrilled to be your guide and show you how to tame your dragons so that you can have the happiness peace and the relationships you deserve Welcome back. We are still here with our friend, Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Um, just so smart, so amazing. And her new book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. Um, such a great message. And we're talking about the five steps, five simple scientifically proven steps to reduce anxiety, stress, and toxic thinking. You can buy Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess wherever great books are sold. And we sort of went through the steps in the last three segments. And now we want to hear from Dr. Leaf about some of her favorite stories and how these steps have actually worked practically. And I love in the last segments we talked about, this is not one of those, you know, overnight, like three minutes to, to everlasting change. Cause that's yeah. just nonsense. She's going to teach yeah. you how to make this a lifelong practice for you to be in control of your mind. So how, what are some of the stories of people doing this? Like what are your favorite success stories? Wow. I have, it is, it, you say that I'm thinking, how can I pick one? There's like thousands know, that have been right? coming through. So I put, I put two stories in the book and, um, but there's one that just, just happened recently of someone who just actually got hold of the, the book and who's actually known of my work for a few years. And they just, they, I actually interviewed them recently and their story is phenomenal where they went through um, as a young child, went through multiple um, from the age of five through 18, they were uh, experienced sexual abuse, but like really bad and in the church and they had a lot of religious trauma and when they went to the this particular person went to like their pastors they there was this whole thing well it's your fault you don't have enough faith and yeah. it was terrible it was so so this person was so traumatized for so many years and always i went to therapy but it was always like talking in circles and then one day a friend actually gave him one of my books and um he started following me and then got this most recent book and we made contact and that's why i actually ended up doing an interview but he just said that he, he suddenly realized when he realized that he had agency had the autonomy to make the past he can't change the past but he could go back and as, as he explains it he could go back as an adult and look at those symptoms all the warning signals the way i described and he could go back and see okay well that's me at five that's that trauma at five and and say that i'm now the adult of whatever 30 35 or whatever in his 30s and i can go to the five-year-old version of me and i can actually say okay this is terrible what happened but now you're safe and they in doing that he said yeah he used the five steps to get to that process and then reconceptualize it so now here's the healed five-year-old um, and so there's the, you know, the dark green leaves being the healed five-year-old. And then that's the five-year-old, the story. So the past doesn't go away, but it's, he's changed how the past played out into the present. And he said he didn't know he could do that. He didn't know he had 
um, autonomy. And I talk about the pathway to empowerment in my research, where when we realize that we have agency over our mind, that our mind is how we think, feel, and choose, and that we have this messy mind and wise mind, and that when we, that we, so with our mind, we can, with our wise mind, we can actually manage the messy mind, because the messy mind's part of life, it's part of who we are, it's never going away. So, but it's, it's so if we deny that or suppress that, then that's not going to help you. But if you accept, okay, I've made a mistake. I snapped. I got guilty. I got irritated. I own it. But now I'm going to, why did I do that? And you do that thought detective work. That's, that's where you're getting that mind management. And this is what this particular person was saying, that they realized that, hey, I can actually stand back and I can see that the pain of how I'm showing up now has got all these roots. And I can, here's a system for going through that. And they were still going to therapy, but he was using that in therapy. And so that was just a great story of how this person now has a platform reaching out to those people that have been very strong traumatized from sexual abuse and um, basically sort of combined use the, uses the five steps to help his, his subjects, his patients. So that is that was really great. I do too. In the sense that when you wrote The Relentless Yes, yeah, so I'm like, my brain is like. Child is you go, I mean, you really yeah. have never seen yourself as a victim, but you really go from a victim to not only a survivor, but a thriver. Yeah, I call myself yeah. a surf driver. That's what I. Yeah, mean. it's beautiful. Surf-driver. Yeah, I love that. I love that because you talk. Uh, you know, schizophrenic. <laughs> make up new words. I love that. I love. <laughs> the other day, I was in. <laughs> yeah, that, surf driver. Yeah, you're a surfer. Right? I love that. That's so. That's that's but, wonderful. But I like this. Um, you know, because that's how I felt when I wrote my story. I saw yeah. the path, well, even what actually when I went through therapy, because I did that a while back, when I went through the yeah. healing process, I saw the past one way. When I yeah. was done, when I, well, it was an ongoing process, but when I went through that process of healing, intentionally healing the past, just like you're saying, yeah. by the time I was done, I couldn't change the past past incident that happened. No. But I did change the way I saw, thought, and exactly your perspective. Yeah. And that's important. Which it's so important. See myself now. Exactly. Feel about your future. Yeah, I feel like a badass now. <laughs> so well, you are a badass. Right. I'm afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, it is because you, uh, you right. basically. We, we you only basic- have a few minutes mm-hmm. left. Let's talk about how people, so they can get the book, but you have other resources for them as well. Yes, um, what I have, um, I have the app, it's called the NeuroCycle app, it used to be called the Switch app and it swaps over, it's right, it actually swapped over this week, so into the NeuroCycle app, it's all updated, it matches the book, it's literally like me giving you therapy and all the um, the basic 21 day, uh, 63 day cycles in there and then I have a whole lot of um, guides. In the second part of this book, we actually explain how to do the NeuroCycle, there's lots of, as you would have seen, lots of examples of how to apply it in um, the five steps for toxic trauma, the different types, big T, small T, acute traumas and toxic habits. And so there's lots of examples. And I've also get put little hacks. So for example, let's say that you have to, you're just about to go into a meeting and someone says something to you and it throws you completely and you've got to kind of get yourself back together so that you can be focused in the meeting. You can also use the five steps for that. So that the, in, in the app, there's also that guide. In, in, in this, in chapter 14 of this book, I actually show you how to use, um, how to use the whole process of, of of mind management as a lifestyle. So I talk about how you can just build it into your lifestyle and how I do it all the time. You can prepare for sleep in the morning using a neurocycle so that you can sleep well at night, all that kind of stuff. So the app's great. Then I have a, obviously, like all of our social media pages, Dr. Caroline Leaf. I have lots of other books as well. And we have a neurocycle lab starting and all kinds of stuff. So there's, there's lots of stuff. I have a podcast, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, which you guys have both been on, phenomenal, phenomenal programs. Um, that you, your interviews and yeah, there's, there's a lot of help out there. So I think all of it is worth that one thing. If you, you, you make, you can't change a past event that happened to no, you, but, but we, you, can, you can have a tool that helps you change the way you think, see, and feel about what happened to you in the past. Yeah. It will change your life going forward. I agree with you. Like you can change how the past plays out into your future. And that's the power. 
It's your past. Does your not past have to does not define you, but fact, you have to get control of it. Absolutely. Totally. And you can because your mind's malleable and you can train your mind. You you are your mind. Your mind is your aliveness. If you're dead, there is no mind. The difference between a dead person and alive is your mind. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to take responsibility for your mind. So mind management is managing your aliveness. So it, man it manages everything else. Yep. You can do it. Thank you, my friend. So, so oh, thank you. Thank you both. Love talking to you both. And health and electricity. I got lots of notes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. So lovely seeing you both and hope we see you in, in, in person soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're interested in coming to Amen Clinics, use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.